Travelling through space and time for mm, how long, maybe thousands of years, but for viewers here on Earth, it's been 60. And over those decades, the Doctor's adventures have featured some faces who have become instantly familiar to us all. So here we go, back in time through the BBC's archives to explore the Doctor's classic period. We'll be meeting and getting to know a little bit the actors who first commandeered that little box called the TARDIS, whilst the nation watched on those little boxes in their living rooms, thrilled and occasionally terrified. We start at the very beginning. The only interview that exists in the archive with the very first Doctor, William Hartnell. The show's first episode went out in 1963, but this is January 1967. After exploring the universe, William Hartnell is in his dressing room at the Gaumont Theatre in Taunton, appearing in pantomime. He actually stopped playing the Doctor some months earlier and probably thought that he'd put those Daleks behind him. But still, people like local BBC reporters insisted on asking questions about them. I'm not brassed off, it's, it's just the, um, uh, it's the association of this uh, of the Dalek uh, question, you know, this mechanical, mobile object that... Um, I'm beginning, I'm beginning to find it, you know, distracting. And they were, they were difficult to play with later. Because they're not, they're not looking into human eyes, you know what I mean? You're looking at a metal object moving about with a voiceover. But it so much captured the public imagination. I know it did, yeah. Do you think you'll ever shake it off? Oh, yeah. Okay. How? Oh. By, by making a success in something else. That's an actor's job. It all depends on the, the script, the type of part that comes along. I don't like... Um, I don't like anything blue or salacious or suggestive or... But I'm not that type of actor. I'm a legitimate character actor of the theatre and film. Do you feel pantomime isn't legitimate? Yes. It isn't legitimate? It isn't, no. No. Why do you think children like you? Because you're rather a grumpy sort of person. Oh, well... Yeah. Oh. I think it is. <clears throat> As I've said before, the... They found me a cross between the Wizard of Oz and Father Christmas, you know. Now, William Hartnell had played the Doctor over 130 times by then, so it's possible he was a little bit fed up talking about it all the time. But in contrast, here's his successor, a very playful Patrick Troughton, and we learn right from the start that, like all good Time Lords, he was right up there with modern technology. After all, how many of the Earth's inhabitants had video recorders in 1973? Patrick! Oh! <coughs> Oh come oh back to us, come back to us, <laughs> yes. What was it like hey as kids, a... kids, all right? Get the recording going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, yes. Yeah. Um, what was it like playing Doctor Who for three years? It seems to have... Was it like a sort of second childhood for you? It was very good fun. We had a wonderful time with some wonderful people. And it was... Uh, well, it was a very jokey part, and so... Um, in fact, you made it a jokey part, didn't you? Because Doctor Who Mark I was a little bit more um, serious. He was rather more old and, and cantankerous, whereas you, you introduced yes. an element of comedy into it. Well, we had to do something a bit different. All you've got to do is to add one of these little number nine pills to each bottle just before you throw it, like that. But whatever you do, and this is important, you must throw it before ten seconds have elapsed. Six, Otherwise, you are seven, liable to blow... What? Eight, eight, Doctor! Ah! <laughs> it works! You haven't played very many comedies, but uh, why is that? I play all the time. What? <laughs> no, I was just wondering, you see, you introduced this element of comedy into Doctor Who, and yet really you were known as a serious actor. Does this mean that really, um, sort of underneath this serious face of yours, you, you really would like to play more comedy parts? But Doctor Who was a serious part. 
it wasn't a, it wasn't a, an unserious part at all. It, it uh, gracious me, uh, Billy had made him uh, this crotchety uh, old gentleman, and he was very serious, and I had to be very serious too. But the way I made it serious was by, uh, well, by making him a bit of a clown to start with, a sort of offbeat thing, you see. But that uh, we started rather wild, and we mellowed as the time went on. You see. You tend to be someone who has avoided giving interviews and talking to the press a lot over the years. Who now, said that? You did. You told me that earlier on. What a lie. Because <laughs> I was, I never I was very interested, though, because you also what gave I me a very good What I said was I always reason. enjoy having interviews with the BBC, which is quite a different thing. <laughs> yes, but you yeah. did say that you liked to keep the illusion of the character, isn't that Did so? I? Oh, yes. Keep the illusion of the character. How do you mean? Yes, well, you're, you're interviewing me now. You'll yeah. explain to me what you meant by that very quickly. Well, I don't know whether I said that. Well, I, I, think, I think what, uh, what we mean here is um, that it's uh, important to take the part seriously, really. That's all it boils down to, which means doing your homework on it. The Americans, <laughs> but not say that really, <coughs> 10 years no. or 15 years ago, they call it the method. You know, what it really means is thinking about what you're doing at home before you come and do it, really. Yes, and, and what it means that Patrick Troughton, the actor, enjoys Steady. keeping himself what? Yes. apart from his the character that he plays. He's two separate people. Anyway, Patrick. I didn't say that either. You're getting I didn't. In a real muddle. It's <laughs> lies, all lies. It may have all been lies, but one bit of truth was that it was actually Patrick Troughton's doctor who first used the legendary device that is the sonic screwdriver. Now, where can I demonstrate? Ah, oh, that revolver will do. It's all right. There we are. And back it goes. But when it came to gadgets, it was the third Doctor who really took things to the next level. John Pertwee wasn't acting when it came to his fondness for advanced technology. Take a look at this. This is a folding caravan. They're becoming very popular with a lot of people for a number of reasons. Right, well, this is the little portafold caravan that I've decided to buy after about a year's research looking at caravans because it is the only caravan that I've found that suits my purposes admirably for when away on location, for example, so that you can use it as a place to get out of the rain and keep warm. Uh, it folds down absolutely flat into a very small trailer, and it doesn't need 21st century Doctor Who magic to do so. In fact, it only takes about 11 seconds. So if you'll excuse me a minute, we'll have a go. actually closer to 21 seconds, but who's counting? And a collapsible caravan wasn't John's only impressive vehicle. Now I'm sure everybody has guessed that this car belongs to none other than Doctor Who alias John Pertwee. Magnificently driven in. John, welcome to Blue Peter. Hello, Peter. Hang on. Uh, let's, yeah, let me clunk click. Yes, every trip. And it certainly is the most extraordinary car I've ever seen, either in the studio or, or on the road, for that matter. Yes, isn't it? Uh, John, it looks rather like a hovercraft. Is it, is it allowed to go on the road? Yes, it is. It's, uh, it's designed by a brilliant designer from Nottingham, uh, Peter Farris, from PCF Motors, who makes it, or made it. It's a one-off. There's nothing like it in the world. I'm sure. And it's, uh, it isn't a hovercraft. It's a proper car, and it is... How, the, how does it run? It, it looks car. as though it's on the cushion of air. It's, right? in fact, on three wheels. One at the front and, and two at the two rear. At the yeah. It's a splendid shape, and uh, I presume it's got all the practical things that allow it to go on the road as well, Absolutely, indicators and lights yes. and so on. Like the, the air scoop at the front here, this is for the jet motor, of course. That's for the jet motor <coughs> when I fly, and it's also for the cooling of the engine. And it's also for the headlights at the front. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and on the side, you've got a weird assortment of lights uh, around the side there. What are those? Well, uh, here we have the, uh, the indicators. They're the lights. Oh, the side we lights the, as well. The, the, and the flashes. And they're flashing at the back as well. And it's a very exciting looking machine. Beautiful silver shine finish. Can I take a look at the back? See yes, what there course. is uh, actually back there. How'd you go? All right, well, I'll follow you. Okay. What's uh, the this flat is where, bit? This is where, where the motor is underneath here. It's a rear engine. Uh -huh. It's on a T chassis. 
the engine hanging out over the back. Yes. Two wheels, one wheel. And on, and on the top here, you, you're using it as a practical thing for luggage as well. That's for luggage, yes. Well, there's not room for a toothbrush inside. True. But if you true. need to carry any luggage, you put it on the back. Well, it's a beautiful streamlined design. It looks as though it uh, goes rather quick as well. What sort of fuel consumption do you get out of it? It's very good. It, it, we've got power to weight, right? It does about 50 miles to the gallon. That's moment. very good. We're still running, running it in. It's not going very quickly yet. What is its top speed when it's running? Oh, well over 100. Is it stable on that with three wheels? Absolutely. Yes, it, yeah. stings, it sticks to the ground like a limpet. Yes. John Pertwee was the closest then we'd ever got to an action hero doctor. And he liked to think he could handle himself in a fight. not kill the king's champion what gave you the kind of inspiration for the flamboyance that well the, the clothes yeah uh, well that was a bit of luck really I put I wanted to wear something rather severe like a Nehru suit and, mm. and uh, they said no they thought that was too severe so uh, in order to do a, a, a something for the front cover of the Radio Times I put on an old velvet smoking jacket and a yeah. and an Inverness cape and uh, a frilly shirt from mr. fish which was very trendy at that time and stood like that on for the front cover and they said, well, we like this, we'll keep it in. And I said, well, how the hell are we going to explain that away? But in the first story they did, they made me go into a changing room and nick a lot of uh, clothing from various doctors. You know, some doctor had a hat and, and some doctor had a cloak. And I picked all these various things, put them in, went outside and leapt into an old motor car, old Vauxhall 3098, and drove off. And that eventually became Bessie. And Bessie would go on to become the third doctor's preferred mode of transport. After the TARDIS, of course. Here we are, Doctor. Well done, Sergeant. Take me to the airstrip. I'll spot him from the air. Get after him, Deathwish, Stuart. I'll contact you by RT. Move over, Bristol. Did you do your own stunts? Yes. Uh, yes, I did, much to the infuriation of Terry Walsh, my stuntman. <laughs> Um, I did everything that I could apart from falling, uh, if it was riding motorbikes or speedboats or, you know, coming down ladders from helicopters and things. I'd do that because I knew I could do it, but falling would be silly because if I broke something, then everybody would be out you of work. You nearly killed half a crew once, did you? I'm afraid so. Well, Barry Lepps, my producer, said, you can drive anything, can't you? And I said, no, not really, not without a bit of practice. And he said, well, there's a hovercraft. Why don't you have a go at that and see if we can get that in the program? So we did. We got it in the program, but Barry never gave me any time to practice. And I kept saying, can I practice now? And he said, not yet, not yet. I'll let you know when. And he never told me until he said, right, go. And so I got into this hovercraft and I had to come up a riverbank on the seven and go between two cameras and go over a stuntman uh, who was lying as an old tramp. And as he lay back like that, I went over the top of him with the hovercraft. Well, I, I did this. <laughs> But unfortunately, there was a very strong wind blowing at the time, and it blew me very much uh, to the port side, and I wiped up the entire camera crew. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, they, they fell. And it was very dangerous, this, because you've got propellers yes, roaring God. around, both down there and up there, you see, so it could be very uncomfortable. And so Barry said, can you do it again? And he said, right, everybody over the other side, go round the, the other camera. And so... They all went round the other camera, and I came, and they said, allow for the wind. And I said, yes, and I came down, and I allowed for the wind, and there wasn't a wind, and so I wiped up all the other <laughs> We've spoken of cars and hovercrafts, but the most famous metallic-wheeled creations in the Hooniverse are, of course, the Daleks. Deadly to all, and particularly irritating to William Hartnell, as we've seen, the man who dreamed up the Daleks was Terry Nation. Here's a gem from the archives where Terry Nation gets a visit at home from the lovely Alan Wicker. One word of warning, thanks to the clunking sounds made by the Daleks who just happened to be trundling along behind them that day, this interview is brought to you with the magic of subtitles. These are the villains of children, are the heavies. Perambulating metal monsters with a tendency to exterminate. They've had a comfortingly unhorrific effect upon the life and surroundings of their creator, a former comedian turned scriptwriter, Terry Nation. Those who cater for the public taste have always found the monstrous a profitable preoccupation. 
Bela Lugosi made several hundred thousand pounds from Dracula. Boris Karloff's Frankenstein cost less than a hundred thousand pounds, but earned five million. Now television offers its rewards. So this is uh, how it all began. How did a dialect come to be a heavy? It, uh, well, I, I, I needed a villain um, in a very quick job. There was going to be these six episodes of uh, Doctor Who, which would take the money and fly like a thief. I needed a villain, and the Dalek appeared somehow. I, didn't, I couldn't tell you an interesting story. They were just a villainous creature that came out of nowhere. And what is there about a dodger like this that, uh, that is villainous? I suppose it's the fact that it is totally non-humanoid, that it's... Um, it has no arms or legs, no facial distinction. So it's not something that's, uh, that's a man dressed up. It really is something that actually works and is created uh, from science fiction. It really belongs to science fiction and not to humanity. And did they frighten children? Yes, although this was never the intention originally. I wanted a villain, but nothing that would horrify them particularly. But apparently it did horrify them. But in their mechanical way, aren't there? Isn't there something almost cosy? Um, I wouldn't have thought so, but uh, people have said so, yes. I, I think that they, the mechanical part of it is in, in some way reflecting bureaucracy and um, the very mechanical life that we face today. I don't think they're cosy at all. And children, you say, some children were horrified. They had to watch it through cracks and Oh, yeah, they were horrified, but they never stopped looking. That was the beauty of it. We got the, the letters came from the parents saying, how dare you put these things on, but the letters came from the kids saying, please don't stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know people talk about being terrified and hiding behind the sofa, and maybe people were. That was not my experience. I, I, I was more tantalised and rather thrilled uh, at what the next monster was going to be and whether it was going to be even more appalling than the last one. It was, I mean, I suppose that is, it was certainly an enjoyable sort of scare. It was, it was a thrill rather than anything that gave me nightmares. I do remember Tom Baker um, brushing away some dust from a puddle and in the puddle there was a laughing clown. That was probably the time I got most properly scared by it. But things like Daleks and Cybermen, I, I mean, I, I was delighted by them. It was, it was rather, it was, it was rather joyous. I suppose a bit like a, maybe a bit like a roller coaster ride, where it's, you kind of know you're safe, but you're very much enjoying being hurtled through thin air. You're sort of the, the, it's a, it was a safe scare, and it was one that uh, I very much looked forward to every Saturday night. <laughs> of course, things are always less scary if you're not facing the baddies on your own. And from the very beginning, the Doctors have shared the TARDIS with a variety of companions, all of them who have played their own crucial role in the Doctor's story. When we're talking about the classic era, one of the most beloved was Sarah Jane Smith, played by Elizabeth Slayton, who had her first Doctor's appointments with John Perry. I'm a journalist, Sarah Jane Smith. Realise this is a very dangerous place to be in. Well, I can't help that. I'm stuck here now. Anyway, we've got all these soldiers looking after us. Are you going to give me away, Doctor? I don't think so. Why not? Well, you can make yourself useful. John did something that was so sweet, but, oh, I wish he hadn't. My first scene was in the open, filming. Um, and it was just a small scene. It may have been with Hal the Archer, I can't remember. And wherever Doctor Who goes, it can be desolate rubbish dump. It can be desolate anywhere. And heads will pop up above of the... And, you know, all of a sudden you've got these people watching. And John came with his cape and his walking stick, which makes into a seat for him. He went over to the crowd. He beckoned me over. Lizzie, darling, he said, come over and meet your fans. I didn't know who I was. I didn't want to go there. Went to hello, I was kind of hand, ha hanging back, and of course they adored John. And then he said, now this is Liz's first scene, we can all watch her. <coughs> Eek! Don't want to go there. Uh, you know, I just had to get on and do it. And he thought he was being so kind and so gentlemanly doing that. But I had a lovely working relationship with John. Right, could we, could we walk into those positions then, please? Stand by once more, please. Well, my first time with special effects and CSO, 
color separation overlay as it was in my time with a blue screen, it's now chroma key. They get you to react to nothing. You're just against this blue screen. They tell you what to do, you can hear them, what you're seeing, how you have to react to it. And I, I didn't actually find it very hard. Um, Because so much is pretend on Doctor Who. You take a big leap into pretense. Well, oh, that must be one of the 700 wonders of the universe. It's even more impressive when we get close. And I was quite pleased with myself. And I looked at the cameraman afterwards as the floor was clearing. He said, yes, that was very, very good, Elizabeth, but um, did no one tell you you have to have special CSO underwear? I said, no. He said, I'm really sorry, but we could see everything. That's why everyone's left. They're so embarrassed. Oh, oh, my God. I rushed, I rushed to the bay where, where, where costume work. They'd locked the door. They were all in, like, banging on the door. Oh, they thought it was so funny. I, I, you know, I work on the premise. People tell me the truth. It was so embarrassing. And it was so embarrassing that I didn't know anyway that there was no such thing as CSO underwear. So I was embarrassed on both camps, but I learnt to be one of the team and get back at them later on. <laughs> and then when we came to do Spiders, Planet of the Spiders, which was John's last story, he started to do something he'd never done in rehearsal before. He would bring his fan mail in, and we had a big rehearsal room, and instead of John being around and looking in on each scene and having an opinion, which he did quite often, he sat at a table at the farthest end of the rehearsal room, with all his paraphernalia around him for replying and his stationery. And after each scene, he would immediately go and start to do that. And you just left him alone. That was his way of kind of, I think, distancing himself. And wouldn't you distance yourself if you knew you were about to be injected with a lethal dose of radiation from a giant queen spider? That was John Pertwee's fate, which meant it was soon time to meet Doctor Number Four. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I can't find Doctor Who anywhere. Anywhere at all. Who are you looking for? Doctor Who? Have you seen him? I'm the Doctor. You're Doctor Who? Tom Baker? That's it. That's marvellous. I've been looking for you through these caverns all morning. Well, here I am. Are you going to do a scene? Yes. We're Can just we... preparing one now. Well, could I have a word with you afterwards? Certainly. Thank you very much. Pleasure. This was filmed just before Tom Baker's very first episode had been broadcast, so the public weren't yet aware of the soon-to-be iconic hat and scarf, or the intensified enthusiasm for jelly babies. Tom Baker, it seems to me, watching you scrambling around on those rocks and so on, that the life of Doctor Who is a bit fraught and a bit dangerous, isn't it? Well, sometimes it's a bit dangerous. I mean, a few weeks ago I broke my shoulder falling off a cliff in, in Dardmoor. And I suppose... I suppose standing on rocks playing with yo-yos... <laughs> I've got to ask you, what, <laughs> kind, what kind of character is, is the new Doctor Who? Well, I don't think that I can really give away what... Uh, I can't really comment on my own character. I mean, uh, the situations uh, will be uh, somewhat as they've been in the past, full of excitement uh, and grave problems that I get involved but, in. But you're, you're not in the traditional Doctor Who costume of flowing robes and... No, and no, it's no. I'm not. Uh, I can't really follow that uh, that very very sophisticated line that my predecessor used. I uh, I think that I have a capacity to be surprised by any like I'm surprised by this situation I'm in now. And uh, would you like a jelly baby? Yes, I'd love one. Um, Thank you very much. I have a capacity for surprise and and for enjoying mm. stories that I do, and to play Doctor Who, hmm. involved with whatever it was, the um, arc in space, the last one, and then the robot and things like that, is for me, a, you know, a tremendous pleasure. Whether, in fact, it will please the regular audience of Doctor Who, I don't know. They'll see it in a few weeks' time anyway, judge. I'm the Doctor. The definite article, you might say. Look here, Doctor, you're not fit. Not you... fit, not fit. Of course I'm fit. All systems go. Set. Look. Heart speed? I say, I don't think that could be right. They're both a bit fast, are they? Well, I don't. Still, must be patient. A new body is like a new house. Takes a little bit of time to settle in. As for the physiognomy, well, nothing's perfect. 
Now, the other three Doctor Whos uh, became national figures, particularly John Pertwee, I should think. Uh, this is likely to happen to you. Is it going to change your life? Presumably, I will be recognised by a great number of people, and the anonymity of my ordinary life will disappear. What is your ordinary life? Well, my ordinary life really is one of a kind of quiet living bachelor who likes some fun. I mean, I work like a dog on this series, and I go home at night and do a few hours' work. Afterwards, I go to a pub and meet friends and talk. That unusual barroom bonhomie captured by a BBC South West team clearly could not last. Luckily, relations with various BBC local reporters didn't break down, and Tom always seemed happy to share his thoughts on landing the best job on telly. She's romantic and charming and good and brave, unlike most of the other sort of hoodlums who masquerade as, you know, main characters in other programmes. There's, there's no problem, there's no... To be really serious, there's not much opposition to Doctor Who, is there? No, there's not. But not really. they, they say that children are the first to, to reject anything that's too far-fetched. And I must say, that as a fairly avid follower myself, I find it pretty far-fetched. But why is it that the children latch on to themselves? Well, I think it's probably skillfully far-fetched. I, I don't think there's any limit to how far-fetched a thing can be, as long as it's done with conviction. No, I really don't. What attracted you to the role? Wages. I was out of work. Well, Tom, this is the moment, surely, to say welcome, Doctor Who, to Climping. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> now, doing, as always, a bit of my research, I'm told that the series has the title The Terror of the Zygons, that under no circumstances must you tell me what a Zygon is. But the story does involve oil rigs that mysteriously disappear in the North Sea a long way from Sussex. Well, so what? I'm a Time Lord, I can fix that. <laughs> yes, that is the answer. Now, how do you feel you portray Doctor Who as distinct from your predecessors? Well, I don't think I can really comment sensibly on how I do it. It's really up to you to comment on how I do it. I know that uh, I get a certain uh, favourable response. The figures are curiously higher than they've ever been. Yeah. Uh, now, some people might say it's something to do with me, and I hope they're right. Yeah. Well, William Hartle, when he got this part, was already nearing the end of his career. And in fact, as you know, he wasn't a very well man by the time he finished with this. He, so he was all, actually naturally very crotchety and quite like a good old pro. <laughs> he used that a lot, didn't he? He was very bad-tempered uh, and abrasive in situations like that, because actually he, uh, you know, was himself abrasive at that period in his career. Then Patrick Troughton took it over and became a sort of pixie, uh, which he's very good at, although he made the transition back into other parts very easily afterwards. It's very hard to describe Troughton, whereas John was much more Holmesian, wasn't he? Very grand, and, uh, and he's so shockingly recognised, wasn't he? He's rather like a tall light bulb, isn't he? Glitters. <laughs> oh, so you're my replacements. A dandy and a clown. Have you done anything? Well, we've uh, assessed the situation. Just as I thought. <laughs> Nothing. One of the problems about playing the Doctor, which makes it interesting for the actor who plays it, and everybody's been successful, it, therefore it would seem to be actor-proof, is that uh, it's not an acting part in the sense that the character is very, very severely limited. Uh, there, are, there are boundaries over which the Doctor can't go. He can't suddenly become interested in romance. He doesn't have those kind of emotions. He's not, in, he's not at all acquisitive. A few years after that interview, in Emerge, Tom Baker had rather ignored his own words about the Doctor not being interested in affairs of the heart, or two hearts. His romance with Lala Ward, who played Romana on the show, and their ultimately brief marriage, got the full BBC News treatment, a sign of just how big a deal the Doctor had become. Now, it was during Tom Baker's era that a new co-star arrived on the scene. Enter K-9. And here is Doctor Who's companion. Pewter Pooch making his very first television appearance away from the Doctor Who studio. Hello, nice doggy. Negative, negative, negative. Do not approach. I have offensive capability. Ah, oh, yeah, but you see, I've talked to the Doctor and Leela, and they say I am a very good friend. Affirmative, very good friend. I like those. Are those your ears up there? Affirmative. Oh. Radio contact with the Doctor Master confirms you as a friend. And you wag, wag your tail for friends, don't you? Well, that depends on the friend. Oh, <laughs> what do you do if you don't like me? I have three levels of offensive capability. 
confuse, stun, and destroy. Yes, all, all right, all right, all right. Yes, I, I believe you. That is logical. I never lie. Never? Recheck. Hardly ever. I was exactly the right age for K9. I would have been at something like eight or nine or something when K9 first appeared. And it was a perfect addition to the show. I loved the, uh, it, it seemed like such a glorious idea. Doctor. Negative, 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 no entry, no entry. Look, whatever you are, I guess. I am K9 and I am warning you. Look, I came to see the doctor, I arrived with him. I do have offensive capability. You have been warned, retreat, retreat. If it had been first introduced to the show when I was in it, I wonder how I would have felt. Would it have felt a little, a little silly, possibly? I don't know. Oh, hey, now we're in business. Master, he recognises me. K9 was in the show when I was in it briefly, and that was nothing but a joy. Um, but if that hadn't been soaked in nostalgia, I suppose it's not the most practical prop to act with, because it's, you know, you can't, you have to, crouch down to be on to be on its level. For maximum impact, I must be stationed directly beside the bat. But you'll be trapped inside. That is correct. Why can't you do that? No alternative possible, Master. Goodbye, old friend. Goodbye, Master. You good dog. Affirmative. At the time, I loved it, and it, the very fact that he caught on this character uh, and became so beloved and became a little toy that you could buy and trundle around your living room very quickly, I think speaks to the fact that it was a, a, a very clever and very uh, uh, popular addition to the show. Yes, as kids, we loved it. Oh, Professor. Yes. I don't suppose we could borrow K-9, could we? Borrow K-9? Uh, what for? Well, I'm not at liberty to say, but he could be very useful. Of course, I understand. Uh, K-9, obey the doctor. Affirmative. Tom Baker had taken the doctor to new heights. He'd become the longest serving Time Lord and been involved in what are now considered some of the all-time great Doctor Who storylines. And it was, of course, time to move on. That meant, once again, Time to play the regeneration game. Do I vary my eye line in this close-up? No, we're just finding it. No. It's nothing to do with the cut-ins. No. Oh, shut up. Just a bit of blinking would be fine. Stand by. We're running. Is it that important, the blinking? And then on a cue, don't blink. <laughs> Terrific. Okay. All right, Sue. This sort of stuff should never be seen, really. I mean, it's fascinating. But this is... I feel like we're intruding on a private moment. OK, Tom out, Adrian in. On. So that was Tom Baker leaving Doctor Who forever in that moment. With your head on that, that's Tom, Here's Adrian, playing the watcher. That way. This is... <laughs> this is sort of... Having one image and lining up with the other is exactly what myself and Jodie Whittaker had to do quite recently. And it was exactly the same technology. It, like Things haven't moved on at all. To be facing straight up. Like that. No, no, that's it. It was as fiddly as it was then. You're right. Don't move your head. head down. Don't move your head, Adrian. Don't touch it. Okay. How's that? Keep your head still, Adrian. Adrian, you're ruining the cobwebs. Okay, darling. All right. Right. It's quite harmless anyway. It's not going to do you any harm. Adrian is no, Adrian's like, get the right, cobwebs. I, I've got one tiny nose hole here. Chris, Adrian out. Peter. Go on, Adrian. Can Sandra give him a hand? Here comes Peter. Come on, Peter. Right there. Head on there, Peter. <laughs> Is Peter wearing the watcher's gear then? Come on, Copper. Just a minute. Just get the head position now right. Now he's trying to line himself up. Look at that. He can see the monitor. Must have been quite nerve-wracking. That, that's smashing. Hold, hold that. Nobody move. And then, oh, yes, he's got quite a lot of gear on, hasn't he? 
Okay. Peter off. Go and get changed. So then he's to get all that gear off and come back again. Do we get to see the final bit? Nobody move. Yes. Wow. It's two, all right. Yeah, off, How there. long that took? That D-rig. <laughs> I wonder if that was the clothes off Tom Maker's back or if he had his own set. <laughs> I bet he had his own set. So young. <laughs> Well, that's quite exciting. I've su such vivid memories of watching that back in 1981, was it? Um, to see behind the scenes is rather thrilling. I mean, I'm not entirely sure how comfortable I would be as an actor, knowing, knowing that my uh, behind the scenes moments were captured for all time and that were being re-shown 40 odd years later. Um, but I'm very pleased that we get to see it today. That was thrilling. It's the end. But the moment has been prepared for. The Watcher! He was the Doctor all the time. And so began the era of the Fifth Doctor, with a Time Lord who looked a lot like a very popular television vet. Did you find it easy to adapt from the role of Tristram in All Creatures Great and Small to the role of Doctor Who? Uh, easy is not the word I would have used, no. Uh, it wasn't easy at all. I guess that I felt there was some pressure on me that uh, to play Doctor Who in the same way as I played Tristram, and I think that was the, that was the trouble. And I had to find in my own way a, a, a different dimension uh, to Doctor Who, but at the same time not let people down in, in, in sort of uh, my portrayal. So I guess I didn't find it easy. You know, I had to think about it a lot, and, and uh, I'm gradually becoming happier. <laughs> I see the Time Lord have emotional feelings. Of sorts. Surely a great weakness in one so powerful. Emotions have their uses. They restrict and curtail the intellect and logic of the mind. They also enhance life. When did you last have the pleasure of smelling a flower, watching a sunset, eating a well-prepared meal? These things are irrelevant. For some people, small, beautiful events is what life is all about. Well, you must have seen the early Doctor Whos. How old were you when... when... I was 12 when they first started, uh, William Hartnell. Which of, your, which of your predecessors have you admired most, do you think? I think it must be Patrick Troughton, really. He was really, you know, my period. I mm. saw him today, actually, um, coming into the BBC car park. What about that? An omen, if ever there was one, I'm sure. And a very nice omen it was too, because it sets us up for a really rather nice moment with Peter, now well established as the Doctor, joining forces with Patrick Troughton on breakfast time telly. And back then that meant a graphic clock in the corner of the screen and Selina Scott swearing off camera. Look at, look at this thing that's sitting there with its, with its, its <laughs> rod there. about to exterminate uh, yes, exter yes, exter yes, exter yes, everyone. Don't you find that thing to me? Oh, how you talk oh. about the Daleks. Oh, dear. Doesn't it give you the creeps? I think these yes. do make jolly good presenters here one morning. You have a day off and just have these two. Yes. What, what a one. good idea. <laughs> it's big, isn't it? It's a than... most satisfactory suggestion. We shall take over from next week. Be careful, K9, or I shall exterminate you. Oh, oh he's fallen <laughs> off. He's fallen you off. Have... But do you know my toes are curling at that? You're you're obviously used to this. You've been brought up with no. Daleks to such well, Oh no, no. I've only uh, I have actually not done a story yet with Daleks, so I've only Don't seen you? the Daleks. No, no, not yet. Really? But I will. I'm going to. I, are I you? insist on Oh yes, we are. I don't. Yes. You know, but but uh, so they have the same sort of. Uh, Horror for me seeing them there now. Yes. What, well, Patrick? You're scared of it, and yet you were the second Doctor Who. You shouldn't be frightened of a thing like that. You were, you were fighting them madly, weren't you? Yeah. Well, those they were very scary things indeed. Hmm. Until we discovered what to do with them, how how to uh, cope with them. Refresh my memory. You memory. jump on their backs and ride around. <laughs> be very careful. <laughs> do not jump on my back, or I will go away. You. Go away. Malfunction. <laughs> Horrid thing. <clears throat> which, briefly, which planet did you m most like? Which planet would you most like to have stayed on if you could have had the chance? Planet. So long ago, isn't it? Well, doctor, what planet? Do the Doctor is meant to be really uh, an 
earthophile, really. Oh, he's not. That's, well, yes, he is. Yes, he, you know, he's oh, well, 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 Yes, Get on yes. well with one another. Yes, we've got on very well this morning so far, yes, haven't we? Yes. We haven't said much to each other, but no, we've got on very well. No. no. Uh, I, you see, I, I have to say this. That I, really, Patrick was Doctor Who, uh, and that coincided when I was watching it most avidly. And the one immortal, uh, the one, the thing that really is burned in my memory is the day that Patrick took over from William Hart. Really? Yeah, it yes. really does, yeah. It's, it's, it's true. And I remember that. I remember that shot for shot, I think. And to lie on the floor. Yes, that's right. be yes. transmogrified. Did you? Did you? Mm. Oh, let, let me leave you lying like that. Oh, it's, sorry. A lovely, it's a lovely <laughs> picture because I want to tell our viewers the time to come oh, yes. down to Earth in a great yes. big bang and tell them yes. the time. It's just after quarter to eight. And coming up in the next 15 minutes in breakfast time, unless I'm exterminated before then, the talking car. We take the lid off British Leyland's new maestro. But first, it's time for the news, weather, and traffic information from your own regional studios. Selena Scott's unexpected outburst was no doubt repeated by Peter's fans across the nation when just four months after that interview, they were greeted with this news. A change is as good as a rest, even for Time Lords. Doctor Who's been going since mid-1960s. It's probably the world's most successful science fiction programme. The character is to carry on, but the actor, Peter Davison, is bowing out and will be replaced in January. As Kate Adie reports, Who's the new Who... Kate Adie? It was posh. I remember seeing this on the actual news. It's become something of a television tradition. Small and not so small fans of the Doctor and his rather odd friends have to be carefully prepared for the next transformation. Just swapping another actor into the role would be unsuitable in a programme cantering determinedly towards its 20th anniversary. It doesn't explain why it would be unsuitable. For Peter Davison, it's been three happy years and it's now time to move on. It's enormous fun to make them. It is enormous. It is very, very hard work, and you seem always to be up against the clock. Very blonde. Special effects in the studio always take a long time. But it, no, it's always been fun. No, I believe. It's, it's it, blonde on the top. Yeah, it's, it's blonde on the one underneath. One of the most well, why not? Fine parts that I've had, but it, you had just have so much fun making it that you could. As I say, the temptation is to go on and on and on, but I think you have to be strong. And, you know. The new who hasn't yet been chosen and addicts of time travelling have until next year to prepare for Doctor number six. Well, John, you've now got the job, John Nathan Turner, the producer of Finding a New Doctor Who, and there's been lots of speculation about what kind of person that's going to be. Give us some hints. Well, I think I'm looking for someone who's older than Peter, uh, perhaps a little more eccentric and even a little bad-tempered. What about all the stories in the papers that you're looking for a lady Doctor Who? Let's have the truth on well, television. Well, <laughs> it is feasible that uh, the Doctor could regenerate into a woman, but it's not something I'm considering too seriously. But you can't rule it out? No. And if you did cast a lady, what kind of lady would she be? Well, I don't <laughs> think it would uh, be a very glamorous lady. It would have to be a kind of uh, middle-aged, uh, crotchety, <laughs> bad-tempered type. I think the, the role of the companion really has covered the, the kind of glamour puss aspect. Peter's replacement was, of course, Colin Baker, and much was made of the fact that he'd appeared in an earlier episode as a member of the Gallifrey and Guard and actually shot Peter's doctor. Luckily, Peter clearly wasn't one to bear a grudge. journey. It was very bumpy actually, wasn't yes, it? Really? You were lot, driving. A lot of turbulence. Lot of Why are you dressed like that? Well, I tell you, Russell, this, this suit cost me an awful lot of money and ever since I bought it, no one ever invites me anywhere. <laughs> I, and, I, and I heard, I'll take this off, I'll take this I heard as well that this is a very classy show. It's not that so high I, class, though, well, I think. So I'll, I'll, I'll mean, raise the tone a bit then. I thought I'd make you feel good. <laughs> so I will. <laughs> By looking all. 
Now, you've now been phased away or passed away or degenerated. What word do you use? Regenerated. You've it's gone? Not, it's not really died, you see, because we're all the same person. So yeah. that, uh, Where have you actually gone to? Where's your spirit gone to? Oh, it's still there. My spirit is still there because, mm -hmm. yes, we all move in our own sort of or, time circles. Yeah. Or now, as a, as a human being, however, from mm -hmm. a job, are you happy to be released from the hoodum? I think so, yes. I mean, I had a great time and I wouldn't have missed it for the world, but I just felt that uh, it was time, having done three years, to move on and do other things. I mean, you have to think beyond, right. you know... Your, your now, he's listening to you very carefully. <laughs> yeah. He's a new boy. Uh, when you were a new boy, what did you set out to do to make yourself noticed and different? Well, when you're cast as Doctor Who, you're not cast to be like your predecessor at all. So you, do, you are given a sort of clean bit of paper and you have to do your own character. I don't know that I was really conscious of making it different, except just doing it the way I felt I should do it. What arrangements are you making to put your own identity onto it? Pretty much the same as Peter, actually. It's, uh, I've looked at all the tapes of all the previous Doctors. Yeah. Not in any desire to copy any of them, but to sort of assimilate that common thing which is the Doctor. Have you worked with him before? Yes, I have, On actually. Doctor Who? Yes. yes. Yes, I uh -huh. actually, I actually shot him. Yes, yes. The nastiest In what circumstances? Uh, I was supposed to execute him uh, because he was endangering Gallifrey, and I was a rather that's where sort I come of. From. Well, we, that's where we come we, from. Gallifrey. Aye. Yes. Aye. That's us. Us, yes. Aye. 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 And uh, he was endangering Gallifrey, so I was commissioned to execute him perfectly legally. Hello, I'm the doctor. Take them away. Do you remember seeing it for the first time? Oh, yes. When? Yes. Oh, you'd be about that high, were you? Oh, you are sweet, thank you. Um, no, I was <laughs> probably taller than I am now, actually. <laughs> <coughs> well, the first one was just over 20 years ago. Yes. It was the same day that uh, Kennedy was assassinated, the right. first episode went out. Right. So they showed it again, I think, the following day or the following week, uh, because they lost viewers then. And, good and I remember it very clearly. You're now part of that proud tradition. Nice. We wish you best, for that, best of luck with that. Which of the Doctor's enemies would you like to do battle with? Well, there are the classics, of course. I'd, I've got to meet the Daleks. Yes. I'd be massively disappointed if I don't. And even though I was sad to see that the Master was destroyed by fire a couple of weeks ago in mm -hmm. one of Peter Davison's episodes, I can't imagine that he's gone forever. And uh, Doctor Who, without having the Master in it, I think would be uh, yes. a very sorry. and they do have a habit of turning up again. I thought he was dead. As you observe, I'm very much alive. Your erstwhile mentor, on the other hand, is about to... I believe your modern expression is, snuff the candle. Snuff the candle? You always did lack style. Style is hardly the prime characteristic of your new regeneration. Oh, do stop squabbling and get on with it. But the threat that the Doctor should then have been most worried about was a human who went by the name of Michael Grade and who just happened to be the new controller of BBC One. Television's Time Lord is to take a rest. The BBC have announced that Doctor Who will be off the air for 18 months. But there's already been an outcry from Doctor Who fans who've called the news staggering. The controller of BBC One, Michael Grade, made the decision a month before the new series was due to start production. <coughs> Doctor Who's been on the screens for 22 years. It's being dropped to save money. A BBC spokesman said it would enable new drama programmes to be made. The Doctor's 110 million viewers will be able to see him back in TARDIS late next year. I had the misfortune of joining the programme at a time when... Uh, n not the, uh, the programme itself, it wasn't the production team of the programme, it was the schedulers, were messing around with the format. What happened? My first series was 25 minutes. The second series they decided to double the length. So instead of four half-hour episodes, it was two 50-minuteers, um, which uh, meant that there was only one cliffhanger in the whole story, which it affected the whole shape of it. And they, they shifted the schedule and they moved it to Mondays, they moved it back to Saturday. I, my first season, I was up against the A-team on ITV, because by that time, ITV was doing anything to, to shake um, Doctor Who out of the ratings. Michael Gray was on record before he joined the BBC of saying he didn't like Doctor Who, so he wasn't inconsistent when he promptly axed it, along with Come Dancing and a lot of other great favourites. Um, he was 
probably unprepared for the reaction, which was tabloid headlines, and I th it merited attention in the um, broadsheets as well. But the headlines on the following day in, in all the tabloids was Doctor Who axed. That's the most important thing that happened in the world that day. Television programme was axed. So Michael Grade suddenly realised he had to justify it. So, I mean, I'm putting words into his mouth, but uh, he said, oh, it's not been axed, it's, um, it's uh, just being rested. We need to look at the format. So you, you, ha you had a, a, an upper tier at the BBC who, who really wanted shot of it. Um, you had the schedulers messing about the scheduling of it. You had a production team who, who felt unloved and unwanted. So the, the programme can now be seen to be in sort of in decline. And of course, who, who do you pick on when something's in decline? You know, the guy who's playing the part. I had a phone call from John Nathan Turner, by that time a good friend, saying, I've got bad news and good news. I said, oh, well, give us the good news first. He said, well, the programme is coming back next year. <sighs> What's the bad news? Well, Michael Grade has said, we have to find a new doctor. He thinks that three years for each doctor is about the right length of time, which is a bit of a body blow. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's in the past. They did me a favour, because it would have been terribly tempting to play that part forever, because it's such fun. So that meant a regeneration scene, which had to be filmed without Colin Baker. And we first got to meet Doctor Number Seven. That was a nice nap. Now, down to business. I'm a bit worried about the temporal flicker in Sector 13. There's a Bicentino refit of the TARDIS to book in. I must just pop over to Centre I-7 and then perhaps a quick holiday. Right, that all seems quite clear. Just three small points. Where am I? Who am I? And who are you? That's how the audiences were introduced to Sylvester McCoy. But let's go back in time even earlier to the very first time Sylvester McCoy performed as the Doctor in front of the camera. Here is a rare and very privileged look at the audition tape that helped him win the job. Hello. I've come for a little chat. How did you get in here? Who are you? Well, to answer the second question first, I'm the Doctor. Leave at once. I am the Iron Woman, the dictator of ten galaxies. I know, and believe me, you need a Doctor. I need no one. I have iron and I have fire. I am the great dictator. And you intend to save the universe? I will save it through iron and fire. I will scorch it with fire, crush it with iron, slaughter all living things and save it. Yes, well, I must say the logic of that plan eludes me for the minute. Logic would always elude you, I can see that. I know what you are now. You're a clown. You dress like a clown. Actually, in my experience, the biggest clowns are the ones in uniform. You have that clown's gleam in your eye, the gleam of tears. You're a pitiful, sentimental clown who enjoys crying over spilt milk. And spilt blood. I'm did trying you to base Doctor Sarah. Who on anybody? Was uh, did I base him on anyone? Yes. Well, when I um, approached... Yes, I kind of based him... I looked at the other Doctors and thought, uh, who am I like in amongst them? And kind of tried to bring out, uh, like, Troughton. Yeah. I'm very much like him, and I kind of slightly Troughton-esque. But also, it was just one of those things that... It's very difficult to talk about. Why, what you do playing the part. It's like asking a painter. I always think it ridiculous when someone comes along, stick a painting up, and they say, now explain that painting. The guy would never have painted the painting if he had, was able to explain anything. You know, that's his way of... So when I act as, in a part, I find it very difficult to explain what I'm doing. I just do it. The costume, all the other things make it. And that's what it is. You've got to judge. How much fame your character and costume did you have? Um, well, quite a lot, really. Uh, the, the hat, I actually wore it to the interview. I think they gave me the job because they liked the hat. And it saved the BBC wardrobe department a lot of money if I came along with the hat. So that was my own hat. Uh, and um, when we sat down and discussed it, I wanted a kind of a baggy jacket with lots of pockets because I thought he'd have lots of paraphernalia. I didn't want to be, have as loud a costume as the doctor before because he's done that one. And I thought I would like a doctor who could walk down the street and from a distance she wouldn't really notice how strange he was until he got close up, really. And I had a, quite a lot of say in that. And in the character, they just gave me the lines and told me to get on with it. So I tried to learn the lines and not bump into the monsters. Did you ever imagine that you would be the Doctor Who? 
Well, on occasion, I mean, I fantasised before I became an actor. And when I became an actor, lots of people would say to me, you make a really good Doctor Who. I was doing another job at the time, I'd been playing Hamlet or something, but they always said, you make a good Doctor Who. So I don't know what, quite what they meant by that. Were it certain qualities belonging to you that were Perhaps. <laughs> How do you think this new Doctor Who will differ? Well, he'd be tall, dark, handsome. That kind of thing, that different. No, he won't. I mean, Tom Baker was tall, dark. I don't know, what if he was handsome? I don't know. For a programme that's all about time, December the 6th, 1989 is a key date. The last episode of Doctor Who ever, as far as anyone was concerned back then. Yes, the next few years were full of exciting talk of Steven Spielberg remaking dozens of episodes with the latest special effects technology. And that did eventually become not a new series, but a one-off television movie. Sylvester McCoy, who was the, the old doctor, the one who's the one who I take over from in this film, you know, he kind of he's been a doctor for seven or eight years. And he kind of took me through it, you know. The uh, the job description. I mean there's an inherent advantage, yeah. I mean production wise, certainly with a character that you can simply and conveniently it must be said, you know, morph into somebody else. Um, so it's in that sense it's been easy. You know, you know, one doctor just takes over from another, no questions asked, you know. There are thousands, like thousands upon thousands, of loyal fans waiting for this moment, you know. And I've seen all the websites, you know. Um, and, you know, like I say, they're here, they're here. And uh, it's there, it's what we call the sleeping giant in England. It's waiting, I think, to happen. <laughs> Yes, we did get Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor, so lots to be grateful for. But for Doctor Who addicts across the planet, it would really be 16 long years before the Doctor rose again. And the reason the fans cared so much and never really stopped campaigning for the show's return was down to these actors that we've just encountered. Along with the writers, producers, directors, cast and crew members who ever since 1963 had created science fiction that was truly magical and laid the firm foundations for all that was to come next. So let's finish with the moment it ended. Sylvester McCoy and his much-loved companion Ace, played by Sophie Aldred, bidding the Earth a temporary farewell back in 1989. Bit of TV history and the end of the Doctor's classic era. Where to now, Ace? Home. Home? The TARDIS. Yes, the TARDIS. There are worlds out there where the sky's burning, where the seas asleep and the rivers dream. People made of smoke and cities made of song. Somewhere there's danger, somewhere there's injustice, and somewhere else the tea's getting cold. Come on, Ace, we've got work to do. And the name of that final story? Survival. Which, all these years later, 60 years since the show started, feels just about right. Until the next time. Allons-y! Over 800 episodes of Doctor Who from classic series to the modern era are available to watch now on BBC iPlayer. While on BBC Sounds, listen to the audio drama Doctor Who Redacted. <laughs> <laughs>